blessed Lord's Day to everyone. Welcome to UEC Jensen's Worship Celebration. So praise God po, ano, for the opportunity to be gathered here face to face and even virtually to bless His name and to be blessed. So as we start, allow me to read a passage from the book of John, chapter 4, verses 23 to 24. It says, But the hour is coming and is now here. When the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship Him. God is spirit, and those who worship Him must worship in spirit and in truth. As we come to worship our living Lord today, and the, even the days to come, let us all be reminded that true worship is not tied up to where we worship the Lord. But true worship is found on the intention why we worship Him. Quoting John MacArthur, he said, Worship is our innermost being responding with praise for all that God is. Through our attitudes, actions, thoughts, and words, based on the truth of God as He has revealed Himself. Let us prepare our hearts as we sing our hymn of meditation. gracious, merciful, and love, have loving Heavenly Father. Thank you for this time of worship that you have given us. As we come before your presence today, we humbly ask for your forgiveness from all the trespasses we have done against you. Thank you, Father, for sending your own Son, Jesus Christ, to save us from your own wrath and from the wrath of sin. We humbly ask that you open our hearts and minds as we worship you and listen to your word today. Speak to us, Lord. We commit to you our worship celebration today. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Galatians 
2.20 says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. So as we sing songs of worship today, may it be our prayer of adoration and declaration. Because Christ lives in us, we are now dead to sin and alive to Christ. Through Christ in me To this I 
May I request everyone to please rise as we sing our next song. And the next song that we will be singing is all about surrender, surrendering our everything to our living God. That I know that as we come today, we have problems. Maybe some of us have heavy hearts. We have needs. But we also come here because we are grateful because we have our God who is there for us. Whenever we need Him, He's always there to accept us despite of our weaknesses and limitations. And this time, let us surrender our everything to Him as we sing this song.
my Father. Because we are nothing apart from you, Lord God. That's why we acknowledge that you are our King. You are our Lord. Jesus, you are our Savior. And we just want to surrender everything that we have, everything that we are. Our weaknesses, our limitations, O oh God, we surrender it all to you. And we pray, Father, that you will work in each one of our hearts, allowing the Holy Spirit, O oh God, to help us to work in our hearts, O oh God. And Father, we declare that you are our King. The Lord whom we worship is alive, Father God. And Lord, we offer to you our worship service and give us a heart, that is willing to accept your word, O oh God, your correction, Father. And we thank you for your love, for your grace, for your mercy that you have given to each one of us, to your children, to your people. And we commit to you everything. In the mighty name of our Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen and amen. Let us remain standing for our offertory. So for our offertory, you may drop your tithes and offerings at the back of the church sanctuary. And for those who are watching us online, you may transfer or deposit your tithes and offering in our church's bank account that is flashed in your screens. So Psalm 96 verses 7 to 8 says, Ascribe to the Lord, O families of the peoples, ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Bring an offering and come into his court. Let us sing our offertory song. Father, thank you for the life and resources that you have given us. As we bring our tithes and offerings to you, we give back to you the abundant blessings you have given us. Use these offerings, O Lord, for the expansion of your kingdom. I also pray, Father, that as we listen to your word today, may you speak to us and plant to us deep in our hearts your word. I pray, Father, for your servant today, that you use him, his words, and even his life as he preaches your word today. We bring back all the glory, honor, adoration, wisdom, strength, and blessings. In Christ's name we pray, amen. So we may all be seated. And let us all be prepared as we listen to God's word through his servant, Pastor Peter San Santos. Sound check. Sound check. And good morning, everyone. Blessed Lord's Day, UEC family. And uh, tomorrow actually marks the first uh, one year anniversary of the first time that I spoke here. No. Parang kailan lang? Seems like yesterday. No, 12 months ago and 8 kilograms ago. <laughs> so I was wondering, bakit sumisikip yung mga damit ko? Ma, may problema ba yung tubig natin o yung sabon natin? And uh, actually, no, I traced it back. Simula akong tumaba when I entered the pastoral team. <laughs> Ang pastoral team po namin, uh, uh, FYI, meron po kaming nickname, Axe. Ang meaning ng Axe, asa kaon to sila. <laughs> or sa Tagalog, kung nasan yung pagkain, nandun sila. Or in English, for where the food is, there the pastoral team is also. <laughs> Ayun. But uh, yeah, it, praise God, no? Yeah, it's been a blessing to to serve for one year here in UC Jensen, and uh, I pray, I hope and pray that I could serve you for many years to come. And uh, welcome everyone again to our worship service. And uh, before we start uh, with the message, can we just give thanks to the Lord together? Uh, Father, we thank you and we praise you because of your goodness to our lives, O oh God. We thank you for this day you've given us to worship and to rest on what Christ has done for us. We thank you for gathering us 
as your people, as one body, together confessing the faith, singing together, and humbly sitting at your feet to be fed from your word. And so we humbly ask, O God, that you would feed us with your word, that your Holy Spirit would open up our hearts and our minds to gladly receive the message that you have for us this morning. This is all we ask and pray in Christ's name. Amen and amen. So this morning, our topic is uh, the discipline of service. The discipline of service. So this is the fourth in our series of the spiritual disciplines. So in the past uh, three Sundays, we've talked about first, uh, Pastor Boris talked about the discipline of surrender, that we are to surrender our lives, to give up and give in uh, to God. And uh, second, we, uh, we heard Pastor Lito talk about the discipline of solitude, how important it is to have uh, time, uh, a quiet time, so time of solitude, one-on-one time with our Lord. And then Pastor David Liu, uh, last Sunday, talked about the discipline of study, how it is uh, important and essential in the life of a, of a believer to study the Word. And now we will be talking about the discipline of service. No? By the way, all of these, these disciplines that we have talked about, these are our response no, to, to Christ and His love and what He has done for us on the cross. We don't do this in order to merit God's love, to merit God's favor, because He has already given us His grace, His love, His mercy freely in Christ. So we do this as a response of gratitude no, and uh, in order for us to grow deeper, uh, uh, grow in our no- uh, knowledge of God's love for us. So now let's talk about the discipline of service. Uh, for most of us, no, the normal order uh, is to be taught what and how before the why. Uh, have you noticed that? Well, we are taught what to do and how to do things, but only later on are we told the principles behind them. So this is not necessarily wrong. No, it's just like the normal order of things. For example, uh, we first learn how to speak as kids, as children, and then only later on do we learn the rules of grammar. So that's the natural order of things. So the topic that we'll be discussing this morning is probably something na ginagawa na po natin, something that we already do, and it's service. We have experienced what it is to serve in the church, uh, to serve our families, to serve the community, and all other kinds of service. Right? So although throughout the message, I will be injecting a few practical applications on how to serve, right? but our primary goal for this morning is to help us have a biblical foundation on the discipline of service. What does it mean to serve? Why should we serve? Okay. So the original languages of the Bible have at least eight words for service. And uh, these words have a wide variety of meanings, like working menial tasks, such as tilling the ground, serving a master as a slave, and ministering to the needs of other people, helping them out. And it, it could also mean a religious service. Now, seeing the various words and abundance of references to service in Scripture, one thing is clear, and that is that we are called to a life of service. All of us, especially believers, we are called to a life of service. Now, let's define service. No? When we talk about service, two things come to mind. Uh, the first is serving God, and the second is serving other people. Right? But is the kind of service that we render to God identical to the service that we render to, to other people? No. Is it identical? Is it similar? Or in what way does uh, these two kinds of services uh, differ? All right. Now, to serve, I have two definitions. No? Finding service. One is to perform duties for a master. Perform duties of, for a master, so you're an inferior and you're serving someone superior. And the second is uh, to help or attend to someone in need. So this does not necessarily mean that you're from a higher ground and you're helping someone below, but it could also mean na pantay kayo and you're helping someone, helping a friend out. So uh, these are these two definitions are what we'll be tackling this morning. So first, when talking about serving God, 
The first definition is relevant. No? When we serve God, we're talking about us serving our master. Us being inferior, serving uh, superior. When Jesus was tempted by Satan in the wilderness, one of the passages he quoted was Deuteronomy 6.13. And Deuteronomy 6.13 says, Thou shalt fear the Lord thy God and serve Him. Okay. So when we talk about serving God, it does not mean that we are attending to His needs. No. It does not mean that we are helping Him out, help, helping Him accomplish His goal, helping Him glorify Himself. No. That's, not, uh, that's not what we mean when we say we are serving God. We are not helping Him out. In Acts 17, if you've read it, no, Paul preached in the Areopagus in, in Mars Hill before a Greco-Roman audience. And as he was looking around, he saw that the, the place was filled with idols. It's filled with idols dedicated to different gods. And uh, there was one uh, idol there uh, which, was, which had the inscription uh, to the unknown god. All right? And as he was preaching there to that audience, he said, God does not dwell in temples made with human hands, nor does he serve, nor is he served rather by human hands as though he needed anything. Okay. So the gods that you worship, they need care, they need sacrifices, and all that sorts of stuff. They need a temple to dwell in, but God is not like that. He is not a God who is served by human hands. He does not need anything from us so if by serving god we think we are helping god achieve something so that in turn no, as we help him achieve something in turn we are now entitled to have our prayers answered by him no, to have something from him then we are wrong that's not serving god we serve god because as christians we are indebted to him for the salvation we have received okay we don't serve god because he needs something but we serve God because He has given us something. He has given us His Son. Now, John Piper said that to serve God means two things. First, it means to do what He says in a way that makes Him look supremely valuable in Himself. And two, it means to submit to Him in a way that makes Him look thrilling. So basically what He says is the goal in serving God is to glorify God, is to make His name known, to make His name beautiful in the world. But Romans 12, 1 says, We present our bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God, which is our reasonable service or worship. So our entire lives are to be given to the service of God with the goal of making His name known throughout the world. But serving God also entails another thing, and that is serving others. This is where the second definition of service comes in, which is attending to the needs of another. Let me read Galatians 6, 7 to 10. Be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. But he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. And let us not be weary in well-doing. For in due season we shall reap if we faint not. As we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially unto them who are of the household of faith. So Paul here writes how God actually cares about the good works that we do. Right? Since uh, they will be rewarded someday. So when talking about uh, the theology of rewards, we should tread lightly. Uh, obviously, this is not talking about being rewarded with a gift of salvation because of good works, because uh, Scripture clearly teaches that we are made righteous, we are saved by faith alone in Christ alone. And it is also not talking about the prosperity gospel, you know, that we, if we have faith and if we do good and obey God, then it will be automatically rewarded in this life with material possessions and good health and healing. So that's not what we are talking about here. In fact, uh, Paul says in Philippians that it is granted to us believers to suffer for the sake of Christ. All right? So the reward Paul is talking here is an eternal future reward, which 
is the blessedness of being in the presence of God one day. So it is not right also to say that the rewards we will be receiving are owed to us by God because our obedience made us deserving of His reward. No. Even those rewards, uh, God does not owe us that one because of what we do. Now, John Calvin gives us good insights. He said, We have no good works which God rewards, but those which we derive from His grace. Even the good works that we do, it is God's work in us. It comes from God's grace. All right? So we have no right to say that I'm a good person because I've worked, I've, I've worked hard for it. I earned it. The transformation in our lives, the good works that we do, is actually a product of God's grace working in us. And the good works which we perform by the guidance and direction of the Holy Spirit are the fruits of that adoption, which is, the, which is, an, which is an act of free grace. So the good works we do is an act of God's free grace. It's the fruits of our adoption, God taking us into His family. So knowing our, that our good works, which is the fruit of our adoption and the product of the Spirit's work in us, will be rewarded one day, Paul says that therefore we should do good unto all men, especially unto them who are of the household of faith. Knowing that God actually cares about our good works and that one day these good works which He does in us, He performs in us, will actually be rewarded. Paul encourages the believers, Therefore, let us do good to all men, especially to the household of faith. So this talks about, again, serving others, doing good to others. So we serve all men. We'll be looking here that we, will be serving, we should serve all men by virtue of creation and especially the family of faith by virtue of redemption. So let's look into this. So first, we are called to serve all men, including unbelievers, by virtue of creation. So what do I mean by this? So though there is an antithesis between a believer and unbeliever, no, a clash of beliefs, a clash of worldviews, a clash of practices, of ethics, believers nonetheless have a solidarity with an unbeliever. Why is that? Because we share in, the, in this, that we are made in God's image. We are all created by God. We are all created as image bearers of God. So all of humanity, regardless of religion, all right, or the lack thereof, we are all image bearers of God. And as such, we are called to serve one another. We are called to serve even those who don't believe in God. Okay. So, in, in, at present, and, but more so in the past, we have seen hostility and discrimination being displayed because of religion. Diba? And it's a sad thing. You don't belong to our religious camp. You're not a Christian. Okay. Therefore, I will be hostile to you. I will not be as good as I will be to my uh, fellow believers, to those who share the same faith with me. So, there is hostility. Be among people of different religions. But this is not what God calls us Christians to do. Though other people might do it, other religions might be hostile to those who don't share the same faith with them, that's not what we are called to do. As Christians, we must serve everyone without discrimination. Believer or unbeliever, men or women, no matter what ethnicity, we lovingly serve them because we are co-image bearers of God. So we are called to serve all men by virtue of creation. I hope that is clear. All right? We serve everyone. But we are also called to do good, especially to the household of faith by virtue of redemption. So I do not think that Paul encourages discrimination here, that we are to prioritize believers rather than unbelievers who are in need. That's not what, I don't think that's what Paul means. I believe what Paul means here is this. You already have great reason to serve all men because you share the same, uh, the same being made in the image of God. Right? You already have good reason, great reason to serve everyone. But when it comes to believers, you have all the more reason to serve them because you are not just united by virtue 
of sharing in the image of God by virtue of creation, but also of redemption. Okay? Us believers, we do not just share the image of God, but we also share in the blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Okay? So we are to serve all men, but we have greater reason to be of service to our brothers and sisters in the Lord because we share in God's image and in Christ's blood. So, so far, we have seen uh, what it is to serve God and to serve humanity, both believers and unbelievers. We serve God as slaves, serving our Master, our Creator, and our Redeemer with the goal of glorifying Him, all right? With the goal of displaying His infinite worth to everyone. Okay. On the other hand, we serve other people, all humanity by virtue of creation, sharing in our identity as image bearers of God, while serving co-believers by virtue of redemption, sharing in the blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So we are to offer our service to them, to help them when they are in need, when they lack finances, Okay, when they are sick, when they need emotional help, or even in the sim simplest things like offering them a ride home, taking them out for coffee or for dinner. We are to serve all men, especially the house of faith. Okay, so we serve people because they are in need. But we serve God because we are in need of Him. So that's what it means to serve God, to serve others. And we also see you know, that uh, serving God and serving others actually overlap in one way or another. So the acts of obedience and service that we render to God actually affects the people around us. Have you noticed that? So in that sense, by serving God, by obeying God, we are also serving, uh, serving others. Right? So for example, obeying God's commands like honoring our parents. By honoring our parents, we serve God. We obey Him. Yet, it also affects our parents, right? They are also being served. And other commands, thou shalt not kill, steal, bear false witness against our neighbor. Now, these are God's commands. And if we honor God, if we serve God by obeying these commands, we are also serving our neighbor. We preserve life. We support the advancement and welfare of our neighbor. We protect their reputation. So, by obeying God, by serving God, we honor both God and neighbor. So serving God and serving others actually overlap uh, in lots of ways. By obeying God's commands, we see, uh, people see rather, our works and glorify God. And in doing so, we simultaneously do good also to our neighbor. Okay. So thus far we have seen now what it is to serve God, serve humanity, and how we are to serve all in general because of creation, and the believers in particular because of redemption. Now, uh, I would like to address you know, a misconception when it comes to serving God. Most of the time, we restrict, uh, we restrict serving God only to full-time ministry. No, we restrict serving God in uh, doing service to the church, engaging in ministry. Right? So, in what, we, what we're thinking is this. No? The pastors and the church leaders and the full-time church workers, they are doing more in God's service. But those who are not full-time ministers, no, engaged lang sa ilang ministry, they are doing less service to God. No? Somehow, there is that uh, idea. So, is serving God restricted to church ministry? Okay. So, in addressing this, no? Uh, it will be helpful to, for us to look at the concept of uh, the distinction of the church as institution and the church as organism. So big words, no? Pero let's explain. No? Basically, ganito yun. Uh, the church as institution refers to the believers gathered for worship. Okay. While the church as organism refers to the believers sent out for work. Okay. So believe, uh, church as institution, it's this. No, the church government, church membership, what we do as a body of believers when we are gathered together. Okay? And the church as organism is what you are as believers outside when you are sent out to do your mission 
in the different uh, spheres of society. So in the church as institution, we see the church in its formal expression. You know, Christ governing his church uh, through the church officers and serving primarily through the ministry of the word, uh, the sacrament and prayer. And we could also include here the various ministries of the church, music ministry, uh, tech team, and other ministries. So as believers of Christ, we serve God and others in the church as institution according to the spiritual gifts that God has bestowed upon us. So lahat tayong mananampalataya, lahat tayong na believers, we are given spiritual gifts by God. Okay? Walang exemption. Lahat po tayo merong gifts. And these gifts are meant to be used to serve other believers. Okay? So lahat po tayo, wala pong exemption. We are given gifts to be used of service to God. All believers have get, gifts which are meant to be exercised for the glory of God and for the building up and the encouragement of your brother and sister in the Lord. So we all serve one another in our local churches. Service does not just, is not, ano ba? It's, it's not restricted, it's not monopolized by the church officers, by the pastors, by the church workers. All of us have a very important part to play in the life of the church. So serving the church does not mean that you have to be here in front teaching or singing. But in the, even in the most simple things, no? that you can serve the church by texting someone, anong prayer request mo? You are serving the church. Okay? In the simplest things, no? Simple does not mean not important. Okay, remember that. Simple does not mean unimportant. The simplest things that we do for the Lord and we do for other believers, sobrang importante po niyan. You don't know how much impact no, that can have in the life of someone else. Okay? So we serve one another. In the church as institution, as believers, as gathered believers, we serve one another. And we all have a part to play. We all have our respective gifts. And we exercise that uh, for the growth of one another. However, we also see the church in its dispersed expression in the church as, as organism. So tayo mga believers, no? In our weekdays, we are dispersed. We are disseminated to different spheres of society. We are called to a particular vocation in the secular world. Okay? For example, some of us here are businessmen. Some of us here are employees. Some of us here are teachers. Some of us here are students. And a lot more. We all have different vocations, different ordinary jobs uh, in the weekdays. So here, in this sphere, in the, in, in the church as organism, when we are sent out with those uh, different vocations, we are also serving God. Okay? That is service to God. We serve God in others by honing, exercising, and excelling in our skills and jobs in the public square. So we are to engage the culture with the gospel, living out the implications of the gospel in all areas of life. Mapa arts, media, uh, politics, business, the, the education, etc. Okay. In doing these things, honestly, faithfully, and in recognition that you are serving God and the gifts that you have, the talents that you have are given by God, no, you are that service to God. And that's important. Okay. We are, as Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5, to be salt and light in the world. Salt not only gives taste, but it also preserves. So we are to give taste to the world. As, and we are to act as preservatives in this lost, dying, and decaying world. And we do that in the respective vocations that, uh, that we are in. We are also to be light. The world is in darkness. So in our respective vocations, as we, when we do it faithfully, we are acting as light. We don't engage in practices like the world does, doing stuff in darkness, but we do it in the light. 
in the public square, we are serving God as well. We are serving God. The things you do in church are as important as the things that you do in your respective vocations. In both realms, okay, in the church as institution and in the church as organism, you are serving God. And that is very, very important. All right? So, I know you're familiar with the hymn, This Is My Father's World. This is my father's world. And so my... Basically, it says that this creation belongs to our Father. This world belongs to our Father because He created everything. So God created everything. And when Christ came here, lived a perfect life, died on the cross, resurrected, and ascended, He did not just come to redeem human beings. Okay. When Christ came here, He came to redeem everything in heaven and on earth. He came also to redeem this broken creation. One day, He will restore and renew the sin-laden and fallen world. If you read Revelation 21, it speaks of a new heavens and a new earth. A redeemed creation. A world, this world being a purged from its sin, from its brokenness, and restored and renewed and made beautiful and glorified. This world, my friends, my brothers and sisters, belongs to Christ. You know, Abraham Kuyper one of my favorite dead guys said, There is not a square inch in the whole domain of our human existence over which Christ, who is sovereign over all, does not cry, Mine. All spheres of society belong to Christ. And if every nook and cranny of this world belongs to Christ, then it is our job, it is our responsibility, it is our uh, obligation as his disciples, to faithfully live out the implications of the gospel in every sphere of life, wherever we may be. And kung ano man po yung vocations natin, that is important to God. And we do it faithfully. right? We do it with zeal. Because that is important to God. That brings glory to God. And that also serves the people around us. So we might have thought that only doing sacred things count as serving God, no, while secular jobs do not. Like for some, their jobs are only a platform to evangelize workmates, to earn money, to financially support the local church. And that is good, no? But the problem is, the job itself cannot be counted as serving God, no? So hindi po ganun. Yes, meron, meron po talagang distinction, I think, between the secular and the sacred. But distinguishing them does not mean divorcing them to the point that only this realm matters to God. Both matter to God, my friends. This is an error, no? actually, that the Protestant Reformation sought to correct, sought to change. Prior to the Reformation, magpakagik mo na ako please forgive me. Prior to the Reformation in the 16th century, there was a huge divide between the clergy and the laity those who are engaged in full-time ministry and those who are laymen, who have ordinary, ordinary jobs, bakers, uh, shoemakers, and stuff, and the like. And the people thought that only those who are served full-time serve God. Uh, those who are clergy, who serve in the church, who are monks, who are priests, sila lang yung serve kay God, while others, not necessarily. So, what happened was the Reformers, when, when the Reformation came, they taught a biblical doctrine of vocation, which basically teaches that all Christians are called to serve God through their respective earthly callings and jobs. Yung calling po na meron tayo in your respective jobs as businessmen teachers, bigay po yan ng Panginoon sa atin. Calling po yan ni Lord para sa atin. And that is your service to God. So you may have heard of the quote, no? How can a Christian shoemaker make shoes? So kung Christiano ka, shoemaker ka, how do you do your job? So it does not mean that lahat ng sapatos, lalagyan mo ng cross, lagyan mo dyan 316. So it not, no, that's not what you should do. A Christian shoemaker does his job, how? By simply making good shoes. And when you make good shoes, you reflect the creativity of your God, of your Father, no? and you're doing your job. You're serving God. Okay? By excelling in our vocations, we are serving 
in glorifying God. Okay. So in the church as institution, the church as organism, we all have a role to play. So ibig sabihin ba nito na total meron na akong vocation, hindi na ako mag-serve sa church, local church as institution. So hindi po ganon. We are to serve in both. Although we are not we do not all serve in equal capacities. No, iba 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 po yung giftings natin. No? Not all are called to be preachers, leaders or deacons. But maybe you are a hospitable person. Then use that to serve your brothers and sisters in the Lord. Maybe you are blessed by God materially. Then use your resources to serve the church. Maybe, ito, you are a good listener. Then serve your burdened brother or sister by listening to their problems. And alongside that, go and fulfill your duty in whatever vocation you're called to do. We are, we, again, we all have a part to play in the service of God in the church and in the world. So every moment we live, is lived coram Deo. It's a Latin phrase which means in the presence of God. Mapasaan man po tayong dako ng mundo, nasa church man po tayo, nasa bahay, o nasa work, we are living in the presence of God. Each and every moment, we do everything in service to God, glorifying God. So as Christians, again, we are called to a life of service. We are called to serve God and people, both believers and unbelievers. We are called to serve God and others in our local churches, and also we are called to serve God and others in all spheres of society. But now we come to the sole reason why we engage in a life of service. What is the sole primary reason why we as Christians engage in a life of service? Matthew 20, 28 says, Even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life as a ransom for many. Primarily, as Christians, we live in service because Christ came to serve us and to give his life as a ransom for many. So yes, he is our example in serving. Pero hindi lang po yun. By his cross, he transforms us into people of service. We don't just look from afar, oh, ang galing ni Jesus, example ko to. Yes, He is our example. But more than that, by His cross, He transforms us, enables us to become people who serve. Bakit kailangan yung transformation na yan? Because we are naturally selfish people. Admit it or not, ganun po tayo by nature. We are naturally selfish. Tingnan lang po natin yung mga bata, yung young kids. Take a look at kids. It would take a lot of effort to get them to share their favorite food or favorite toy with their friends, with their peers. So serving, service, actually runs contrary to our nature. It is easier for us to be selfish than to give our lives for service, to lay down our lives to serve other people. Okay? Self-service is more natural for us than it is to serve others. Diba? We want others to serve us rather than us serving them. Yun yung mas natural po para sa atin. Even worse, no? at times, we even use God as our cosmic butler para gamit, magamit natin to satisfy our lusts. So at the very core of our being, as sinful beings, we are self-serving creatures. However, Christ came and displayed a very different way to live. Instead of getting people to serve Him, and rightfully so, anak po siya ng Diyos. He is God. He is Lord. And He deserves to be served. But when He came here, rather than being served, He lived a life of service. He healed the sick. He raised the dead. He fed the hungry. And take note, hindi po lahat ito, presumably believers. Some of them might have received the service of Christ but never trusted in Him. Yet Christ lived a life of service. And ultimately, He laid down His life for sinners, which is the perfect and ultimate display of service. He drank the bitter cup of God's wrath and took the punishment of sin 
upon himself for your sake, for my sake. By trusting in him and his sacrificial service for us on the cross, we receive forgiveness for our selfishness and redemption from our self-serving ways. The service of Christ transforms us into men and women of service. Understanding the service of Christ for us on the cross, trusting in Him, we are now enabled to be men and women who serve other people as well. Since the Son of God Himself laid down His life in service for us, then I too willingly and gladly serve other people. Christ transform us into men and women of service. I will be ending with this. Now. Have you ever wondered why our gatherings are called worship services? No, yung word na service. Bakit kaya ganun? In the early church, uh, gatherings, church gatherings were called Misa, from where we get the word Mass. It comes from the final words spoken by the priest, parang benediction, no? at the end of the gathering. He says, Ita Misa Est. Or, go, it has been sent. So, si St. Thomas Aquinas explains that yung meaning po nun, go, it has been sent, it means the victim, Christ, for them, has been sent to God through the angel so that the sacrifice might be accepted by God. So, although we do not agree with our friends, Roman Catholic friends, that every Mass, Christ is sacrificed afresh on the altar, we still get the sense no, ng, early, ng church, ng early church, na uh, the worship service is primarily God serving us. Kaya po siya worship service. God is serving us. Christ speaking to us through the Word. Christ feeding us spiritually through the sacrament of communion. It's, it's God in Christ serving us. Another word used by our Lutheran brothers is Gottesdienst, which means divine service or God's service. So the idea is similar. When we gather for worship, it is God who's serving us. So after the worship service, no, when the benediction is pronounced, we go in peace, being assured of the comfort we have in the gospel after singing, after hearing the word preached, after praying together, and after having God's covenant promises confirmed in both baptism and the Lord's Supper. God serves us here primarily. And when we go out, as we, are be, we have already been refreshed by the grace of Christ, so we go out in service to other people. So God's service to us in Christ empowers us to live a life of service. So I hope and pray that this message has been an encouragement, a blessing po para sa atin, na way na encourage po tayo to be men and women who follow after the footsteps of our Lord and Savior in Jesus Christ to live lives of service to God and others. Shall we close in prayer? Our dear, loving, and heavenly Father, we acknowledge that uh, we have erred in our ways, Panginoon. Uh, most of the time, it's easy for us to be self-serving, to be selfish, rather than to live lives of service. Yet, Father, we praise you and we thank you because you sent Jesus to redeem us from that slavery to self-service, to transform us into people who delight in serving you and in serving other people. So this is my prayer for my brothers and sisters this Lord's Day, that you would refresh us with your grace, remind us of the service of Christ for us on the cross of Calvary, so that as we leave this place, we will be excited to serve our families, to serve in our respective vocations, and eager to serve our brothers and sisters in the local church through whatever means that may be. And so I humbly ask and pray from you, O God, that you would dismiss us, dismiss us with the fullness of your grace, and may we faithfully live out our vocations as disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ, living out the implications of the gospel in all spheres of society. This we only ask and pray in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen and amen.
Shall we all rise for the doxology hymn? the end of our service. Now go in the grace and peace of our Lord Jesus Christ. God bless us all.